Gina McCarthy, Assistant Administrator for the Office of Air and Radiation at EPA. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here, Susan. Um, you talked a bit in your speech about uh, federal versus state level action when it comes to energy efficiency. What, what do you expect? Do you expect this to remain mostly on the state level, or what, what could we see from the, from the federal government? Well, I think we pretty much know that a lot of the programs that are, are important have to be run at the state level. Uh, they're our partners, they have been for years. I think what you see now is an Obama administration that wants to enhance that partnership. Um, what he's trying to do is provide funding through the agencies, use common sense approaches uh, to start investing in energy efficiency and use the already existing folks that have been doing this in the utility sector um, and, and uh, in the states uh, and enhance their work and move it forward in a big way. Um, you talked a little bit about the endangerment finding at EPA. I, I just wanted to ask you, since it's now under full court assault right now, um, are you guys moving forward with the rule proposals uh, as the litigation takes place? Oh, sure. Uh, the, the, you know, every rule that EPA has put out uh, for many years now gets litigated. Um, it's pretty common practice. We do the best we can, and clearly in the uh, endangerment finding, uh, we spent a great deal of time and energy. Um, we documented our findings well. Um, we worked very hard to make sure that we were using the best science and, and that we legally uh, did uh, the job that we needed to do to make sure it was sound. So while it is being challenged, it was expected, um, and we think the rule is sound. We know it's based on sound science, and we expect it to hold true, and it is in full force and effect. Um, while, while the petitions move forward. And so no hesitation challenges. during the appeals process? No, none at all. Okay. No. Um, the, uh, the, the endangerment finding, um, tell me a little bit about why, why EPA t took this tailoring rule up to 75,000 uh, tons of CO2 a year, and you expect more litigation because of that for um, maybe from environmentalists to try to get you to enforce the lower limit. Yeah, the tailoring rule is all about taking a look at what the Clean Air Act says and how to apply greenhouse gases appropriately within the context of, of the Clean Air Act. Um, when we proposed it, we thought a 25,000 uh, ton per year level uh, was going to be about right in terms of the kind of uh, numbers of permits that states would have to deal with. As a result of taking a look at, at the comments that we received, um, we know we, we didn't calculate effectively um, just the impact of that 25,000 level. So we're looking at the comments. The administrator has already indicated that we're going to go significantly higher than that. That decision hasn't been made or announced yet. It is in its final uh, review. Um, it's sitting at the Office of Management and Budget. We expect that rule to come out shortly. Um, I think you will see when it comes out that we did the best job we could to look at the comments we received uh, to provide a tailoring rule that is really based on common sense that does get at the largest industries first. That 75,000 does yeah. allow for at least small factories to squeak by. Well, we haven't really decided on a number, so I know you're talking about 75,000, but I think we have to wait till the rule gets out. But the idea was that that rule should capture the largest facilities. We should learn how to apply uh, best available control technologies to those facilities. We should be very deliberate, um, and we should be phased in our approach, and we should look at it over time. Um, and we should find a way to deal with these small facilities in a way that's different um, than how you would look at large facilities. What about those who say that this raising of the limit um, speaks to the inappropriateness of using the Clean Air Act to regulate? Um, I think that what we're trying to do with the limit is to make sure that we apply a, a very legitimate uh, tool of the Clean Air Act appropriately looking at greenhouse gases. I don't think it's about whether the Clean Air Act is, is a good tool to use in and of itself. Um, I think that greenhouse gases are a pollutant. I think we can regulate it. The challenge we have is to make sure that we use the right tools in the Clean Air Act in the right way, and I think we're going to be able to do that. Well, what do you say to the Cal Dooley's of the world? I mean, he represents the chemical industry, yeah. who says give Congress a little bit more time to act before you um, you put in these rules yourselves, which he says uh, give no market signal. The, the thing that I think Cal would recognize if he were here as well is that the challenge we have is that the Clean Air Act does come into play. Uh, that is what the Clean Air Act says. The tailoring rule is not about regulating, it's about deregulating. It's taking a look at a rule that if we didn't take action on, it would apply to six million facilities. So what we're looking at is how do you tailor the requirements of the act in a way that makes sense, and it's about only applying those permitting requirements to the largest facilities. Tell me a little bit about um, what you said about the big emitters and, and the mandatory reporting rule. Yes. How will that drive change? 
Actually, the mandatory reporting rule is an effort to look at facilities that generate 25,000 tons of greenhouse gas uh, emissions a year. Um, it, apply, it will capture about 80% of the emissions that are generated, but only the largest facilities. And what it will do, it will, it will require them to systematically look at greenhouse gases that are being emitted. And when you look at a manufacturing facility, every time they generate a greenhouse gas, it, it is reflective of a, a, an energy efficiency issue. They're using energy efficiency, they're combusting. Every time they look at greenhouse gases, they should be looking at money flying out the window and translating the, these, these pollutants into opportunities for greenhouse gas reductions. Now, the toxic release inventory was a rule that the, the EPA uh, has been administrating for years, and that was a public reporting of toxics releases. We think a public reporting of greenhouse gas releases will have the same effect as the toxic release inventory. Nobody wanted to be at the top of that list. Right. And so it will provide tremendous incentive if you're publicly reporting your greenhouse gases, it will provide tremendous incentives internally for those companies to look at how they can be more efficient and save money, but it also will be a public relations issue where they will not want to say that they are inefficient, that they are generating a significant amount of greenhouse gases. And there are all kinds of programs out there that can service these companies, programs that are running out of utilities or at the state level that can actually, if the demand is there, they can service it. Okay. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, energy efficiency overall, for it to really make a dent, for it to really make a difference uh, and reach the, the goals of the White House. Um, tell me about changes in Americans' behavior. Do you, yeah. do, what do you think we will, will be needed um, uh, going beyond what we have so far? Does it need to go beyond that 35 miles per gallon uh, by 2016? You know, I, I think that energy efficiency has always been looked at it, it, almost like energy conservation, and it's not the same thing. Um, it's not about sacrificing. It's about getting more efficient. Um, it is going to be about uh, unleashing innovation. It is going to be about investing in newer cars, better cars, cars that people want to drive. You know, the challenge for us is not to ask people to go backwards in terms of their quality of life, but to provide them the kind of products and tools and services they need to keep enhancing their quality don't of life through energy efficiency. You don't see real lifestyle changes for, for Americans. Uh, yeah, as long as those lifestyles are actually improving their lives. They don't need to sacrifice. They need to start looking at best opportunities to be as efficient as possible and save themselves some money. Like, do you see uh, um, utilities control of uh, smart grid, um, control of consumer appliances through smart grid, sort of in exchange for lower rates where they can control, uh, you know, certain appliances that we use at home? Um, I, do, I do think that that's, that's part of the scenario. I mean, l let me give you just an example. I know that there are some areas of the country where you have differential prices on electricity, where the high peak demand periods, you pay more for electricity. And people know that. There are some actual homes that have little lights that say, okay, here's when my, my lowest energy price is. And people revolve their lives around doing their wash at a time when it's the lowest energy price. They save money. We don't need to build peaking power plants. We're talking about giving the utilities the power to make those changes. That, that, that could very well be true, and it may end up being the best system available. Uh, I can't make a judgment on that. It's going to be up to the different regions and the different states for what's most amenable to their uh, constituents. Okay. Gina McCarthy, EPA, thank you. All right. Take care.